got leave to go in the government. Uh, Colombia waved him by very ostentatiously. Come back, right. Rex. We right. love you. He got there. He worked in the agriculture department. He he became head of something called the resettlement in administration, where they moved people around, as mm -hmm. in John Steinbeck. Right. A lot of poverty, the Dust Bowl, and so on. It, and he saw that a lot of the projects weren't really working. Mm -hmm. Some worked. For maybe fertilizer worked. Mm -hmm. Money so farms wouldn't have to be sold and right. foreclosed upon worked. A lot of it didn't work, and he had deep amb ambivalence. He made planned communities, mm -hmm. Greenbelt, Maryland. Right. He cozied up to Eleanor, who also appreciated. Right. They both drank uh, New York State champagne, which right. Roosevelt thought was awful, and right. it probably was. I think the market has proven that. <laughs> yeah. So well, and then they th and they kind of threw him out. Uh, mm -hmm. But not before he had laid the plans for his own little Soviet farm, right. which which is in Casa Grande, Arizona, mm -hmm. and he tried it. You know, he put settlers in, <coughs> tried to make a town. Right. And he gave them houses, and they were painted. And these were people like the migrant workers in the photographs. These right. were people with nothing, and he, they signed up for the town, and they were supposed to work together and have economy of scale in just one tractor. Again, right. and what's wonderful is. Um, that Tugwell saw and was honest about it mm -hmm. and admitted it wasn't working. Much later, a student of his went to interview about it, mm -hmm. and he discovered that the settlers in the little farm hadn't worked together and that they had fought and that they had trashed the community house mm -hmm. and that they had resisted the manager right. and they wanted uh, they wanted milking machines for example which is a completely yeah. rational thing to want right. to get productivity up for milk sure. but the administration or the authority down there didn't want it because part of the thesis was that this was creating jobs right and they take away a job when you have a machine so all these fallacies were underlying everything and Tugwell saw that too Tugwell right. understood the importance of efficiency so he, he and he tried to go back to Columbia and they wouldn't have him mm -hmm. even though he had an apartment on Riverside Drive mm -hmm. so he kind of went around in the private sector uh, and eventually did get a reward he became governor of Puerto Rico where he encouraged um, land reform that had too much of an aspect of expropriation for our taste. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, but he, and then he spent a lot of years being a professor trying to rewrite the Constitution because he concluded, looking at the New Deal, that the problem was the Constitution. And if only mm -hmm. we had a more modern Constitution. But he was an honest man, right. and I follow him all the way yeah. through. Well, he's, uh, you know, he pops up in a lot of things. Uh, about a year ago, I reviewed a book about the mono a Monopoly board game, and Rex Tugwell is a player in that because his oh, yeah. economic ideas are just um, infused one of the um, early uh, prototypes of the game. I mean, he's a fascinating character. Now, you mentioned the, the Constitution. We need a more modern Constitution. Earlier, you had mentioned the Schechter brothers. These are uh, another set of, uh, the book is filled with great characters. Uh, talk a little bit about the Schechter brothers and how the Constitution ended up helping them out of a, uh, a kind of dark place. Well, you remember the Supreme Court you had was a very conservative court, mm -hmm. uh, what we would call conservative. They had decided the Scottsboro Boys, so they were both they they were regarded as bigoted and conservative right. and retrograde. Right. And the Schechters were a small uh, chicken slaughter business. They were kosher Jewish bushers in Brooklyn on mm -hmm. Ralph Avenue, and they were prosecuted under the NRA. In fact, they were the case that was picked to go to the Supreme Court to prove the constitutionality of the NRA. Right. Because the NRA was being challenged, or it wasn't clear if it actually fit into the Commerce Clause. That's right. The, uh, the Commerce Clause um, limits what the federal government right. can do in the states, right? right? And uh, It has to apply to interstate commerce. It has to, and yeah. what is interstate commerce, and right. did the NRA right. breach that? And everyone knew there needed to be a test. Right. So this chicken business was picked because in another case, chickens had been interstate mm -hmm. commerce. Right. And they were prosecuted very nastily in the, for, for low, a lot of sins, lowering prices. Mm -hmm. That was illegal. It's always a problem. Uh, always a problem. Um, working too many hours, bad, yeah. bad, competing. Yeah. And when you go and look it's, back, it's a, a miracle they even sin. they even got a trial. It's a miracle so. that well, and and they're they. I, what I liked about them was they, they were furious. Mm -hmm. They realized that what the government was saying was wrong. To them, it seemed like probably like the Tsar's Russia, right. where their family had recently come from. Right. And the lawyers kept saying things like, "You're not an economist." The lawyers talked down to them. They right. said, "You're not an economist. Right. You don't have any agricultural economics." I'm paraphrasing. So yeah. 
and they would say, "No, I don't have much school. I'm barely speak English." But but and their they were their English was mocked. But when right. they got to the Supreme Court, the argument went to them because of the logic. Right. They said their lawyers said one of the rules of the NRA is the customer may not pick his chicken. Right. America's about consumer choice. Right. And he imitated for the justices how the chickens were selected in the name of efficiency and the justices laughed and right. then when the justices laughed because one of, one of the things the NRA um, forbade was actually looking at a chicken coop and saying I want that chicken that's my chicken there right. and you couldn't do that and that in a time when there was still tuberculosis mm -hmm. and not antibiotics right. picking your own chicken was important right. if for health reasons you right. didn't want a sick chicken this is known as the sick chicken case right. and the justices sided with the Schecters and they said this is delegation run riot right. what about the Commerce Clause and so on um, and there was a lot of discussion around mm -hmm. that and it was an enormous event because if the NRA had stood we'd have the kind of intervention that we have in agriculture right. in business right. so it changed it shifted America forever yeah. they never caught back up and the English people saw that right away mm -hmm. new NRA killed in 20 minutes they right. wrote in the English papers in America they were so shocked they didn't know what to say and of course Roosevelt was furious so. one of the one of the interesting sidelights to that story too is a, and, and it struck me that in a way that was also uh, it's too um, uh, overblown to say the last stand of WASP America, but a big part of the tension in that case seemed to be a kind of old patrician America versus an immigrant America. Um, and there were a lot of class distinctions that played out in that trial. And it was kind of interesting that the old court, which in many ways was retrograde, it was very 19th century, ended up siding on the side of these uh, you know, pidgin English speaking, pidgin uneducated uh, Jewish immigrants. Whose lawyer, the columnist Drew Pearson, had mm -hmm. mocked as right. a hook nosed. Uh, right. in, the, in those days, they wrote mean things in the right. papers yeah. about people. So, uh, and that was what was so wonderful about mm -hmm. it. They were the small business, and it right. didn't matter what their ethnicity was. Right. They had been wronged, and the Supreme Court saw that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and. Uh, Every, one of Mrs. Schechter wrote a poem ab about it. <laughs> she said, I'm proud again to show my face. So I, I thought this was a wonderful right. story, and we yep. never learned it in school because yep. it was against FDR, but it was an important, right. important story. Right. Um, speaking of people who are against FDR, and another interesting character in this book is Wendell Wilkie, who ended up running against uh, uh, Roosevelt in 1940 as the Republican candidate for president. Talk a little bit about Wendell Wilkie and how he, I mean, because he's ostensibly, he, he may be the hero of the book, really. Um, and, you know, what was his role in all of this, and how does he end up? Wendell uh, thought he was a reformer. Mm -hmm. he, he was for Democrats. Right. Uh, he was for reforming, and he was originally in the utility business. So he started out in this business, and they were going to have clean utilities. There were corrupt utilities. Right. His was not going to be like that. It was going to be clean and wonderful. And he built up this utility company very lovingly, Commonwealth mm -hmm. and Southern, and mm -hmm. it was going to light up the South. Mm -hmm. But then the team... Which at that point had virtually no electricity. That was the part running. of the country yep. that half that wasn't right. lit up, right. or the third. So, so the TVA law was passed with the mm -hmm. same mandate and this is the, the Tennessee Valley Authority Tennessee Valley yeah. Authority and this is the same power struggle that mm -hmm. we talked about before between right. public sector and private sector and Wendell met in a room with the, one of the leaders of the TVA David Lilienthal and he said David Lilienthal you're in government now but in a couple of years you're going to come out you want to be reasonable so you can get a job in the right. private sector your statute is egregious I'm paraphrasing right. but your statute is egregious and it's going to be changed, so you won't mm -hmm. have money. So why don't you cooperate with me, Commonwealth and Southern, and we'll strike a deal. Maybe you make the power and I distribute it, or you take mm -hmm. one geographic area and I take another. Right. And essentially, Lilienthal, this was at the Cosmos Club in Washington mm -hmm. here, said, no, you don't understand. We make the power now. It's over. Right. I report directly to Roosevelt because their TVA did not go to the Secretary mm -hmm. of the Interior. It had a unique structure. And was the TVA at that point, was that the, I mean, that must have been the single largest kind of public works project in American history? Well, I don't. I mean, there had always been canals and dams.